just as the body needs food and nourishment, the mind needs nourishment as well. The Buddha identifies three different kinds of food for the consciousness of the mind. One of them is sensory contact. Sights, sounds, smells, taste, tactile sensations, making contact at your eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. And there's the act of consciousness itself as those things make contact. We're constantly looking, listening, hoping to get some nourishment out of things outside. It's like popcorn. You can fill yourself up, and it's not necessarily good for you. The most important nourishment for the mind, though, are your intentions. The way you feed the mind through your intentions is going to make a difference between having a healthy mind and an unhealthy mind. Health food for the mind comes in the form of right resolve, one of the factors of the path. You resolve on renunciation, resolve on non-ill will, resolve on harmlessness. In other words, you're going to find your happiness in a way that doesn't have to involve sensuality, doesn't have to have involve any harm to anybody at all. That's in harmony with other people's well-being. So when you're finding happiness, getting the mind concentrated, that's an expression of resolve on renunciation. We think about renunciation simply as depriving ourselves of something. But the Buddha is actually having us deprive the mind's hunger for sensual pleasures. And the only way you're going to do that is, on the one hand, to see the drawbacks of sensual pleasures, and the other is to provide it, the mind with an alternative pleasure, the pleasure of concentration. So try to breathe in a way that gives rise to concentration, a sense of well-being inside. And here you have free range. You can breathe long breaths, short breaths, fast, slow, heavy, light, deep, shallow, any combination of those. You can try experimenting with different ways of breathing for a while to see what feels good right now. And think of the breath going deep into the body. For most of us, it's something that we sense at the nose, sense maybe around the upper chest, and that's about it. But to go deep down inside. Think of it spreading down the nervous system, spreading through all the blood vessels of the body, and bring nourishment to all those places. Sometimes it's good to start out by going through the body section by section to familiarize yourself with how the breathing process feels in different parts of the body. You can start down around the navel, work up the front of the torso, up the neck into the head, then down the back of the neck, down the shoulders and the arms, out to the hands, and then returning to the back of the neck, going down the spine, down to the tailbone, down to the legs, down to the feet, taking it section by section. And you may not feel much in terms of any difference between the in-breath and the out-breath in those places, but think of them just being open, so that if there is breath energy, it can flow. If there's any pattern of tension or tightness, any sense of blockage anywhere, think of it dissolving away. After all, the breath can go through anything. It's energy. And think of it coming before your other sensations in the body. All too often we feel that the solid parts or the pains in the body are there first, and then the breath has to be pushed through them or work its way around them. But just hold in mind the perception that the breath energy in the body is there first. It has priority. It can go anywhere. And that allow yourself to settle into the sense of whole body breathing in, breathing out with a sense of ease. A sense of fullness and refreshment. And this is the expression of resolve on renunciation. When you're sitting here like this, it doesn't seem like you're re renouncing much, but you, you're certainly not thinking about the world outside, you're not thinking about any other things.
hoping to find happiness or pleasure in this thing or that outside. And that's what renunciation means, is being wise in your search for happiness, wise in your search for well-being. Renouncing the kind of happiness and pleasures that can lead to either harming other people or harming yourself. If you're absorbed in sensual pleasures, then the mind gets obscured. It's not as clear as it was. So that's one form of food in right resolve. Then there's the food of resolving on non-ill will. In other words, either good will or equanimity. Don't wish anybody ill. This too is food for the mind, good food for the mind. Because if you look for happiness in a way that harms other beings, you're going to have to start lying to yourself. Either they're not being harmed, you tell yourself, or they don't matter. All of which is a dishonesty in the mind. This is one of the reasons why this form of resolve goes well together with the practice of concentration. When you're finding your happiness inside like this, you don't have to go feeding off of other people. And that puts you in a position of strength. If we don't feel nourished inside as we go through the day, our food is going to be intending to get some pleasure out of what other people say, or what they do for us. And when they don't do anything for us that we want, or they do things that we really don't want, it's like we've gobbled down bad food. But if you have this sense of well-being with the breath, it's a lot easier to feel goodwill for everybody, even when they don't behave in ways that you like, because you're not trying to feed off of them. And then you think further, this is good food for your intentions as well. As the Buddha never says, we have goodwill for other beings because they deserve it. We have goodwill for other beings because we need it. We want to make sure that our actions are skillful in what we do and say and think. We have to think about the happiness of others. If we don't care about their happiness, we get careless. And then when we're careless in our actions, then it becomes bad karma. So this is good food for the mind. Now, as I said, non-ill will means both goodwill and equanimity. Because goodwill is something that can be developed as an unlimited attitude. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha calls it a Brahma Vihara. It's, it's an attitude that Brahmas have. Our human goodwill starts out as being pretty partial. We have goodwill for people we like, people who have been good to us, and we have ill will for people who have been bad to us. The Brahmas are above all that. Of course, they live in places where nobody can do anything to them anyhow, so it's easier for them to have goodwill all around. Here in the human realm it's harder, but it's actually more important. As I said, we can create all kinds of karma. So we want to be careful about the intentions that we feed on. Goodwill is expressed in what? It's expressed through our generosity, it's expressed through our virtue. If you read the Karnaniya Metta Sutta, the Buddha talks about all that goes into living a life that makes it possible for your goodwill to be honest and sincere. It requires being restrained. In fact, the Buddha calls goodwill a type of restraint. We don't usually think of it as an unlimited attitude. How is it restrained? But it restrains our greed, aversion, and delusion. And it requires patience, because people will behave in lots of ways that are not in line with what we want. And that, of course, brings in equanimity, because even though our goodwill may be unlimited, we have limitations in terms of our energy, how much we can give, in terms of our material wealth, our time, our energy. These things are limited. So 
some cases where you have goodwill for others, but you don't have the strength to help them. It's either because of your karma or because of their karma, a combination of the two. The Buddha has you reflect, okay, this is the human world where we're living with people who have mixed karma. We have mixed karma, other beings have mixed karma. What that means, of course, is we have good and bad karma in our backgrounds. And good and bad karma is going to show itself in this human realm. The devas may have both good and bad, but for the time being that they're in the deva realm, only the good will show. But we're living in a mixed world. So we can't let our goodwill get mixed, but we have to realize that our goodwill may be unlimited, but there are limitations on our, the help that we can give to others. That's where we bring in equanimity. We have to learn how to not feel guilty about the fact that we have human limitations. There's only so much that a human being can do. The Buddha said you don't want to give to the point where it hurts. You give in a way that doesn't harm yourself and doesn't harm the recipient. That's a wise gift. But that means there will be limitations on your generosity. So you bring in equanimity as part of non-ill will. And it's not indifference. It's just the bringing the reality principle to your goodwill. As I was saying earlier, when the Buddha teaches equanimity, he doesn't teach it on its own. In terms of the Brahma Viharas, it goes together with goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy. In terms of the factors for awakening, it goes together with mindfulness, analysis of qualities, persistence, rapture, calm, concentration. In both contexts, the context is important. In terms of the Brahma Viharas, as I said, you practice the equanimity of a doctor. The doctor wants the patient to get cured, but realizes there are going to be patients that you can't cure. There are diseases out there that are beyond anything a doctor can do. But the doctor doesn't give up. Instead of getting upset about what he or she cannot do, the good doctor focuses on what he or she can do to make sure that the patient say has as little pain as possible, but doesn't develop any additional diseases. So this is equanimity, not the equanimity that gives up on things, it's the equanimity that puts aside things that are impossible and looks for the area where you can possibly help. As for equanimity and the factors for awakening, that's basically one of the factors of concentration. And as the Buddha said, if you do just equanimity, equanimity, just be, be the knowing, be the knowing, be the knowing, without making any choice between what's good and what's bad, what should be developed, what not, your meditation doesn't go anywhere. Nothing develops. So it's going to require mindfulness. It requires that you analyze what's skillful and what's not skillful. And when you see that something is unskillful, then you bring in the persistence to Abandon it. If it's something is skillful, you bring in the persistence to develop it. So it can give rise to a sense of bitti, it's called in Pali. It can be translated as rapture, refreshment, fullness. It's basically the nourishment that keeps you going. And bring the mind to calm and concentration. Of those seven factors, there's one sutta where the Buddha points out three in particular that are important. There's the persistence, the concentration, and the equanimity. The persistence is the more active of the factors. Concentration and equanimity are the more passive. The Buddha compares it to the work of a goldsmith. The goldsmith puts the gold in the fire, and then brings it out, and blows on it, and then looks at it. Or sometimes looks at it first, and then blows on it until all the impurities are gone. If the goldsmith simply put it in the fire and left it there, the gold would burn. If he simply sat there looking at the gold, nothing would happen. If he simply blew on the gold, nothing would happen. 
in the same way. He said, putting the gold into the fire is like the persistence you bring, the effort, the ardency that you bring to the practice, wanting to do this well. And here it's interesting to note that when John Lee is talking about the factors of mindfulness, alertness, and ardency in his discussion of right mindfulness, he points out that the ardency, the persistence, is the factor of discernment and wisdom. Just as when you understand the Four Noble Truths, the wisdom lies in seeing, well, what should be done with those Four Noble Truths? If something is, qualifies as suffering, you don't just sit and look at it. You try to comprehend it. Where is it coming from? Where is it going? What exactly is this? With craving, you don't just say, well, can I just accept the craving coming and going? You actually actively try to abandon it to the point where there's no more nostalgia for craving. The cessation of suffering is something you want to realize, and you do that by developing the path. If you just know the Four Noble Truths, but just let the knowledge sit there, and that's not really wise. So it's the desire to put forth the right effort. That's where the wisdom comes. So the persistence is putting the gold in the fire. Concentration is blowing on it, cooling it down. Equanimity is looking at it. So the good goldsmith does all three, and the good meditator does all three. And it's in this way that you nourish the mind well. And your equanimity gets balanced. As for the third type of right resolve, being resolved on harmlessness, harmlessness here means basically the same thing as compassion. When you see that other people are suffering, you want to help. But here again, you have to have your equanimity. There are times when you want to help other people, and they're beyond your help. Again, look at it as, as karma. Some people have the karma that no matter how many People want to help them, the help just doesn't get through. Or in some cases, you may have the karma that you can't help that particular person, but maybe somebody else can. You don't take that as a sign that you're bad. Simply, that you don't simply you don't have the right karma with that person. When you have this attitude, it's a lot easier to live in the world and not feel depleted and to not let your nourishment get wasted away. So you're nourishing the mind here with breath energy. You're nourishing the mind with a sense of well-being that comes from a concentrated mind. You're nourishing it with goodwill, and you're nourishing it with equanimity. This is how your mind stays healthy and strong. Uh, as John Fung used to say, your, your goodness doesn't break. This is important because sometimes we give, 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 and then we break. And then we don't give at all. You have to learn what your strength is. And that's actually an expression of goodwill, too. Think of yourself as a marathon runner. You don't just run as fast as you can. You pace yourself. And even healthy food for the mind is something, if you gobble down too much all at once, it's not good for you. Pace yourself in your concentration, you pace yourself in your goodwill. Pacing yourself in concentration means that Okay, when you have an opportunity like this to meditate full-time, you go for it. When you have to go through the day, we have other responsibilities. You learn how to take what might be called your pocket jhana. That little bit of concentration you can maintain, sense of well-being that you can maintain. And you accept that, okay, given your circumstances, given your responsibilities. This is as much as you can do, but you can nibble on it all day long. 
the only thing that's keeping you from nibbling on it is your own lack of skill in maintaining a sense of well-being as you go through the day. So learn how to feed the mind well. That way your goodness stays strong. and can grow.